my name is Polly McKenzie. I am the director of Demos, a think tank in the UK, uh, working on broadly social research. Um, uh, and this panel is about going it alone for the people who are still outside the system, including the rising number of people on unstable incomes with multiple employers within the gig economy, uh, self-employed. We uh, recently at Demos did a whole piece of research uh, around the experience of gig workers and self-employed people in the economy. Uh, and the absolute most fundamental finding that we had is that people are terrified about their pension savings. Uh, it's the thing, even though most people actually really love being self-employed, they love the freedom and the flexibility that it gives them, there's that kind of niggling sense at the back of their mind that there's something they haven't sorted out. And that came through so strongly uh, in our research that when Will asked me to come and chair this session, I thought, excellent, I will come away with some more solutions to how we resolve that kind of really deep-seated anxiety that is impacting on people's lives through their working life and, of course, will affect massively the amount of money they have to live in retirement. Um, so if my panel want to join me on the stage, we have um, Connor Darcy from the Resolution Foundation, another think tank, almost as good as Demos. Um, Will, who you've already been introduced to several times from uh, Nest, and Avni, who is from the uh, Rotman School of Management, which is part of the University of Toronto. And she has traveled at great personal risk on an airplane in which there was a fight in order to be with us today. So we should be incredibly grateful to her and definitely make notes of all the intelligent things that she says. So I will um, pass over to our fantastic panelists. Connor, do you want to go first? Thanks very much, Polly. Um, so uh, as Polly mentioned, Resolution Foundation is a think tank, and we are focused on people on low to middle incomes. So a lot of our work focuses on the labor market, and obviously, one of the big stories in recent years has been what's happening to self-employed people. Uh, so just to kind of give you a bit of background about who exactly the self-employed are, uh, you know, where, where a lot of the growth in recent years has come from, what they're like, so I'll talk about that first, and then talk a little bit about what we know about their, you know, how much they've got saved up, their wealth, and some of their attitudes to, um, to retirement and to pensions. So firstly, I think it's, it's just really important to note the extent to which self-employment has driven a lot of the employment recovery, especially in the, you know, in the first uh, few years after the recession. So you know, the, one of the kind of the unusual things about this uh, recession and recovery is that it's been very employment rich. So employment rates are, you know, consistently reaching new record highs, which is great. Wage growth hasn't been as good, um, but the employment picture has been really strong. And the self-employed, uh, the, the uh, red line there, you can see how you know, it kind of didn't really drop off in the way that employees, the number of employees did uh, immediately kind of after 2008, 2009. We've just seen it kind of consistently grow. It's slightly plateaued in, in recent months, um, in recent years, but we're still talking around nearly 5 million people in self-employment. Uh, which is a hell of a lot more than it, it used to be. Um, so of all the employment growth we've seen, self-employment's accounted for 35% of it, despite making up only about 15% of the workforce. So a big deal. Um, so I think, you know, in a lot of the conversations around that, especially, you know, initially in the, in the kind of the earlier days of the recovery, it was, you know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Are these people who can't find employee jobs, are being forced into self-employment to, to try and get by, or is this more you know, uh, um, entrepreneurs trying to do their own thing, inspired by Dragon's Den, et cetera, or you know, for all the reasons Polly just mentioned, the freedom the, uh, and the flexibility. But I think increasingly the, the debate shifted to the, the gig economy, the concerns around people there. It's only you know, this week, uh, things around Uber and Hermes, lots of um, kind of constant coverage around you know, the rights of these people and how much they're earning, the positions they're in, the power that firms have in, in these sectors. Um, but you know, when you look at actually who is self-employed, self and the mix of them, uh, you know, the gig economy seems to be quite a small part of it. So hopefully you can see each of these bubbles represents uh, kind of an industry, uh, and these are all self-employed people. So the bigger the, bigger the bubble, uh, the, the more uh, self-employed people are, are in it. So you can see some of the biggest ones, we're talking joinery and plumbing, construction, a lot of these kind of traditional trades, industries that you might think of as self-employment, maybe some that you wouldn't expect so much, like, like retail or, or, or health, but a lot of the other ones that you might expect, you know, lower end, like cleaning, like hairdressers, farming, professionals. The kind of key takeaway from this is the self-employed are a very mixed bunch. You know, we shouldn't just kind of think of them in, in one way like you know, we would never dream of doing with employees. 
the whole you know, first session was all about how different people are and how people have different needs, expectations, outlooks for, for retirement. The self-employed are, are no different. And you know, the gig economy definitely shouldn't dominate the debate around the self-employed and, and their needs as, we, as they move towards retirement. You know, I think the gig economy, one, is probably overblown. Um, to the state, the, the extent to which it's dominated the debate, it's, it's been really good for shining a light on the, the more precarious end of self-employment. So I think sometimes you know, there's a caricature that the self-employed traditionally were people who maybe had been in employment for a long time, moved into self-employment, quite comfortable, had a lot of assets to draw down upon, and that kind of allowed them to take the risk of being self-employed. But I think you know, we do have this group of what we've kind of called here precarious uh, self-employed people whose earnings, their, their income, which you can see on the horizontal axis, is kind of a little bit below the average for the typical part of that group, and less, you know, on average, less well, um, you know, less well qualified, less likely to have a degree. Now, within that group, uh, there's you know, a whole range of people who've got you know, uh, plumbers and, and construction workers in there, and I'm sure lots of people have met very non-precarious plumbers with quite high salaries. Um, so there's definitely variation, but I think, you know, just to kind of group them roughly, we can see that there's a definitely uh, a lot of people there in, in you know, kind of some insecure sectors like cleaning, like hairdressing, where, uh, like taxi driving, where we might not always expect them to have quite high incomes. On the other end, uh, you've got the more privileged group who I think probably increasingly get a little bit overlooked. Um, some of the, you know, the, the big ones there are health, IT, um, consultancy, law. Uh, now, obviously, and probably some people in this room who fit into this category who I'm calling privileged but might not feel themselves very privileged and might feel more precarious in terms of financial health. But you know, as a general position, on average, they're got higher incomes. And often, this kind of measure doesn't really capture all of their income, so we might be you know, even understating how much they have. More likely to be um, more highly educated, probably have a few more options in terms of what they do. Um, so they, you know, this group of privileged self-employed people really deserve attention too when we think about um, what's going on and, and their future. And I, I think it's, so it's interesting. I think if you just went off of media headlines, you'd assume that a lot of that growth that I showed in my first slide has been driven all by you know, the precarious increase. But actually, while the precarious make up the majority of the self-employed, roughly about 60% to, to 40%, um, in terms of the increase since 2009, most of that's actually come from the privileged. And some of the fastest growing industries within self-employment have been advertising, public administration, banking, all tend to be quite high paying. Which on the other hand, taxi driving, you know, obviously with, with Uber, it gets brought up a lot. It's only grown by about 8% as opposed to, you know, the total self-employed population growing by 23%. Um, so that's not to say that, you know, there hasn't been some underlying shifts in who the self-employed are. They're definitely younger than they used to be. Um, there's definitely more non-grads in there. We, it's, again, to kind of hammer home this point, it's a, it's a very diverse population, essentially. Um, so we shouldn't just kind of pigeonhole them in, in one way or the other. So I think, again, in terms of what we're thinking about long term, what this all means for the, the pensions industry and for people's position uh, uh, in terms of their saving, their, their retirement outlook, what's driving the increase in self-employment is a really important concern. Because if it is you know, all to do with uh, choice and decision, people valuing flexibility, freedom, wanting to work that way, that's you know, important to know. If it's part of a, a global shift, the kind of rise of technology, app working, all that sort of thing, that's obviously very important to know. Um, or if there might be other factors going on, then that might suggest that you know, policy changes might affect the number of people who are self-employed and the size of this population that we're talking about. So just looking internationally, we can see that the UK actually looks like a bit of an outlier. And a lot of other countries haven't seen the really rapid increase that we have over the past you know, 10 years or so, or even going back to the millennium, uh, the turn of the millennium, we can see that that increase has uh, been, you know, the UK has, has been one of the few where we've actually seen kind of consistent growth. So it doesn't seem to be like some, you know, inevitable uh, uh, something driven by globalization or technology. It seems to be more kind of uh, unique to the UK, although not entirely unique. So I think one of the main factors, there will be a whole range of things and, and you know, the, the kind of the more cultural, social elements definitely matter a lot, but I think the tax position is, is really important to, to consider and just 
this is probably not the most straightforward <laughs> chart, but essentially the point is that employees for the same amount of market income are paying a lot more tax than self-employed people. So that's, you know, as long as that disparity exists uh, in the UK, we're probably going to see, you know, the self-employed number not drop off massively. So again, I'll, I'll touch on it again later, but if you're thinking about what might change positions, what might shift some people, um, how big the self-employed population is going to be in the long term, I think this tax position is, uh, is you know, a really important kind of background consideration. So what do we know about the self-employed and retirement? And you know, it's, it's definitely not a clear picture, and I'm, I'm sure that the Nest Insights and the, the stuff that Polly mentioned uh, demos have done is, you know, these all won't perfectly sync up, but this is just from some analysis that we've done of, of mainly from the, the Wealth and Assets survey that has a little bit on attitudes. But just to talk first a bit about you know, how much uh, pension wealth the self-employed actually have, um, in, you know, for some angles, it doesn't look too bad. So the, the first uh, bar there is, the percentage of employees and the self-employed that have any pension wealth. So this is for 2014 to 16. So these gaps might get a bit wider as the full effect, you know, they will get wider as the full effect of, of auto enrollment for employees comes through. But you know, we still do have half the self-employed who do have some pension wealth. So you know, on the face of things, it doesn't look too concerning. And when we look at the amount of the median amount of pension wealth that those people with at least some pension wealth have, we can see that the self-employed aren't too far behind employees. Now, you know, on average, the self-employed are older than employees, so you might expect them to actually have built up a little bit more in terms of pension saving for the same point. But you know, again, not massive differences. Doesn't look to be uh, terribly concerning if you just look at this view. But I think when we look at the numbers actively contributing to a pension, I think this is a pretty striking trend that we've, this is again an index based on where you know, the number of self-employed and employees who are actively contributing to a, a personal pension. And we can see how it's you know, really dropped off a cliff for the self-employed. There's definitely you know, a, a crisis linked drop there, but we haven't really seen much of a pickup uh, in, in recent years, even as self-employment uh, started to uh, recover in terms of their income. And I think it, it's really interesting. This is just purely in terms of numbers. So this is the actual number of self-employed people contributing has fallen hugely, while also the number of self-employed people as a total group has kept rising and rising and rising. So you know, there's definitely been a bit of a mismatch. And the average contribution, uh, again, using these stats, which are from HMRC, for the self-employed has kept rising and rising. So that kind of suggests that it's, it's the lower end self-employed, lower income self-employed who might have, have stopped uh, paying in. So at the moment, we've got around 25% of the self-employed actively contributing versus 66% uh, of employees. And again, we'd expect that gap to, to grow. And when you focus on you know, the median pension wealth across all of the self-employed, so including those with no pension wealth whatsoever, gets down to 2,700 pounds versus around 15,000 pounds for employees. So I think from that point of view, it looks a little bit more you know, uh, concerning if, if that was the only wealth that they had to draw upon. So what's, what explains this kind of gap, essentially? So when you ask self-employed people, what are the, the main reasons for not contributing um, to a pension? These are the, the top three, so things don't add up to 100% if you're, if you're trying to calculate this. Uh, but it tends to be financial difficulties. So uh, low income, just saying they can't afford to, or saying they have too many expenses or bills or, or debts uh, seem to be some of the, the major issues. Again, it's not too different from employees, but some of the work we've done in the past suggests that this sense of not being able to afford to or being on a low income stretches a bit further up the income distribution for self-employed people than it does for employees. Now, you know, that probably makes sense. Self-employed people, a bit more vulnerable, things can go wrong, the more the financial pressure is on you. But it, I think it's interesting just to bear in mind that some of this is just people feel they can't afford to. But there are a, a range of other issues there that I'll touch on. Um, and you know, some people say they prefer alternative forms of saving. So I think that, you know, that financial difficulties issue is really backed up by what we know about their incomes. And this is just, again, median uh, weekly earnings for um, employees versus the self-employed. You know, there's consistently been a gap, but what we've seen you know, in the crisis, self-employed earnings took a really big hit. Employee earnings also fell, but you know, not as sharply. And we've started to see a pickup in self-employed earnings, which is obviously really welcome, but that gap is, is, is still really wide. Um, and you know, for a lot of self-employed people, this is uh, probably quite uh, still pension saving probably feels like a, a second order uh, issue for a lot of people. Now, obviously, there's always issues around how exactly self-employed income gets captured. 
it's probably getting underreported to some extent, but I think you know, the size of that gap and the fact that it has widened in recent years is, is, a, is a, a worry for, for people trying to encourage self-employed people to save more. So what do self-employed people expect the, the major part of their retirement income to be if, if they seem less, uh, less prepared in terms of pension saving? Uh, and again, comparing employees, the blue, bar, the blue bars there with the self-employed and the gold bars, you can see that unsurprisingly, the employees are more likely to say occupational or personal pensions than the self-employed. Um, but you got, you've got a range of other factors that are coming in there that self-employed people might be you know, just choosing to not use pensions. And it might be personal choice. It might be, again, the kind of people who go into self-employment might be more willing to take risks, just deciding that things work in different ways for them. So if we just take a look at a few of these different options and what we know about them. So savings and investments is, is slightly more popular for the self-employed than for, for employees. But when we look at, the again, the median financial wealth for the self-employed, so that's taking in you know, how much you've got in current accounts, savings accounts, ISAs, stocks and shares, uh, it's, it's only 4,150 pounds, typically. So that is a little bit higher than for employees, but you know, if for, for people who are, if, if we're betting the house on self-employed people entirely relying on their financial wealth, that seems a bit risky. Uh, two of the next most popular ones are related to property, and the self-employed are a bit more likely to, to own their own home. And when people get asked what's the, the the chart on the left there is what's the safest way to save for your retirement. The chart on the right is what's the, the way to make the most of your, of your kind of uh, savings pot for retirement. Uh, property is overwhelmingly popular for the self-employed. Um, but I think there's interesting questions around, you know, when you ask people, do you actually plan to downsize? People aren't fond of downsizing. Uh, lots of people will only own their own home rather than, you know, have, you know, be uh, landlords with multiple properties. So again, this, Property will definitely be a route for some self-employed people, but for lots, it won't be. And you know, obviously, we've seen home ownership fall and fall and fall uh, for a whole range of groups. So, especially as you know, more millennials and Generation X uh, people who are moved into self-employment less likely to be homeowners, raising again more questions are over how exactly they're going to fund uh, their retirement. Um, and the the if I go back, the one of the other ones that came up there, and again, sometimes you hear is that they'll just sell their business. They'll you know. When they get to retirement, they'll have built up uh, either a company and a brand that they can pass on, or you know, um, stock or other things that are you know, tangible and you can sell to, to fund your retirement. But when you ask self-employed people what they plan to do with their business when they retire, closing down is definitely the, the, the main response. Not yet decided uh, is also very common, and only 7% say they're going to sell it. Uh, uh, to fund their retirement or keep it running to, to fund their retirement. So again, very much a, a minority position for, the, for, the, for most of the self-employed. Um, so in terms of what actually might change people's minds, what might encourage people to um, save more into, into pensions and, and get on board with that, this is a, a question which said, you know, what would enable you to do that? And the self-employed were given a range of options. Uh, so well, that's slightly depressingly, if you're, if you're keen on getting self-employed people into pensions, none of the above was the, the most common response. So there's, there's some people who just aren't interested, and that's obviously fine. And it might well be that you know, that 38% are a mix of people who do genuinely have large financial assets or a property or business that they can actually sell off and might fund their retirement. So they might actually be fine or they might be more of a concern. But I think it's interesting that there do seem to be some things that some people say they would be open to. And obviously, when you say, what would change your mind, what would help you, people uh, might say things that might not actually make a difference. But I think it's still interesting to take account of what people did, did say. So the opportunity to contribute to a pension. So again, you know, Nest is, is, is open to self-employed people, as far as I know, but there's not much uh, of it being sold to them actively, I don't think. And uh, obviously, there's not the, the easy trigger of just being automatically enrolled. So I think that's an interesting one over how you know, reducing barriers to, to pension saving is an interesting one. Again, kind of touching on some of the stuff I think that we, we talked about uh, in the first session, the guarantee that a pension will give you a certain income and the kind of reliability uh, is, is an important point. Clearer understanding of how much they're going to get from the future state pension, which again is, is important for the self-employed, um, and increased tax incentives. Well, we'll see if, if that happens. Um, uh, fewer barriers to withdrawing pension savings, again, uh, pre-retirement, which is, is something that comes up a lot. So I was slightly surprised that it was this low, but you do often hear that self-employed people want to keep the money in the business, or if they need to invest in you know, growing the business, that they don't want to lock up a huge amount of their wealth in something that they can't touch. So again, uh, it's quite a small group, but 
potentially something that we might want to talk about. So just to recap, uh, at the end, self-employed, again, really diverse, gig economy. We shouldn't forget about those kind of workers. There's definitely a lot of precarious workers who are self-employed, um, but they are you know, uh, a really mixed group. Lots of the self-employed have, have never been engaged with an app. It's not their main way of working. We shouldn't lose focus. We shouldn't kind of focus on the shinier, more media-grabbing bit and forget about the, the vast majority of the self-employed. Uh, the tax system's probably playing a really big role in, in the growth of self-employment. If you wanted to, if you were concerned about this group who are missing out, as well as for a whole range of other reasons that would make the, probably the Treasury very happy, you might want to equalize the position between employees and the self-employed to remove that incentive to be self-employed. But you know, there's also that, that could potentially be a route into addressing some of this. So while auto-enrollment not, might not be the perfect system, moving towards some kind of uh, position where companies hiring self-employed labor might have to make some kind of contribution is something that's been talked about in the form of kind of a payroll tax. But again, that's probably a little bit further down the road. And there's a variety of reasons why the self-employed aren't saving, um, some which we can probably do more about than others. Helping self-employed people to earn a lot more is probably uh, a bit more difficult than information or other factors. But I think it, you know, it is a really important conversation and doing more to get the self-employed better prepared for the retirement is, is really important. Thank you very much. So next we have Will. Uh, okay, thanks. So um, I'm just gonna speak for a few minutes uh, about some of the thinking we've been doing in Nest Insight about this challenge. I'm, I'm conscious that I'm sandwiched between two uh, experts in, in, in various aspects of this, and, and we're really just at the start of our journey in thinking about this topic. But what's very clear is that this is a, a major priority for our sector, for the government, in, in trying to replicate some of the success that we've talked about this morning in the traditional workplace in moving uh, retirement saving or long-term saving into this, this group, the self-employed. Um, so I want to just talk about four things. Uh, I'm first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about kind of language and terminology. I think it's important to try to understand who and what we are talking about here. Secondly, I'll talk a little bit more about the scope and scale of the problem, although not very much, because I think, I mean, you know, Connor's done a fantastic job addressing that set of issues. And then really what I want to focus on is, 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 is two kind of major observations. One is you hear a lot of, said about automatic enrollment and its extension to the self-employed, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about why I'm not maybe totally convinced that that's the solution or as, as powerful a solution as, as some might hope it could be. And then I'll talk a little bit about kind of, well, what else could and should we try very much focusing, as I, as I talked about this morning, on this idea of, of practical solutions. And hopefully that will segue neatly into some evidence from some actual practical solutions. Um, so look, just, I mean, a quick point about language. I think self-employed, the gig economy, contingent workers, you know, as Connor said, I think the gig economy shone, shone a light on this topic, but isn't actually necessarily the kind of major component of the problem. It's still a relatively small part of the overall um, self-employed sector. I think it's also worth saying that actually, I mean, a lot of the things we're going to talk about are also relevant to people who maybe are in traditional employment, but are in multiple jobs and therefore aren't earning above the auto-enrollment threshold. And, and more generally, kind of precarious workers, people whose income is highly fluctuating, might spend time, sometime in, sometime out of the kind of formal system. So really, from our perspective, what defines the group we're interested in here is none of these terms on the left. It's really their relationship to the retirement system and the fact that essentially we're talking about the people for whom a traditional employment relationship is not their dominant source of income, who are therefore outside of the scope of automatic enrollment, at least as it has currently been conceived of, and therefore who we need to think about at least partially in back in a kind of voluntary frame for how do you get these people to, to choose into some kind of savings for themselves. And when I say some kind of savings, that's the second kind of definitional point I would make, which is that, you know, for reasons I'll talk about as we go through, I, I think it's healthier to think about this problem as how do we get people in these groups saving for the long term than it is necessarily to automatically think about getting them saving in a traditional pension. And we'll talk a bit more about, about kind of why I think that may be part of the challenge as we go through. So just a couple of quick additions to Connor's kind of e excellent setting out of, of the evidence. I mean, really to try and spike a couple of the received wisdoms that you hear about in this debate. So sometimes you'll hear people say, well, it's fine that the self-employed aren't saving in a pension because they have a lot of wealth elsewhere, they hold a lot of wealth. And it is true that the self-employed are overrepresented in the kind of upper quartile of wealth, uh, wealth holding in the UK. But actually, that's really, 
that really falls away when you look at age. So really, that's a, a function of there being a, a self-employed population who are rather older and who do hold a lot of wealth. When you strip those people out, what you're left with, particularly among younger self-employed and gig economy workers, is a combination of both low wealth and low income. So I certainly don't think we should be complacent, and I think the debate has moved on in the last six months not to be complacent about the idea that low participation in the pension system is somehow not a problem here. And then the other kind of potential myth that maybe needs busting um, is one that certainly I've, I've said and I've, I've sort of assumed to be true, but, but this slide is one that I saw um, John Lawson from Aviva present a few weeks ago at another conference, and, and is kind of interesting because there's this idea that those who are in self-employment or one of these groups generally are people who might be using that to kind of top up some other source of more traditional income and, and you know, that it's a kind of sec a second source of income. But actually, at least on the face of it, the data doesn't really bear that out. So there seem to be a lot of people who are self-employed and draw practically all of their income from self-employment a lot of people who are traditionally employed and draw practically all of their income from traditional employment. And you look at that kind of part-time self-employed group, and actually their second biggest source of income is, is retirement and pension income, which kind of says some interesting things about where, where that group sits. And so whilst this data doesn't deny the existence of these people who are doing sort of top-up income type models, it at least suggests that it's not the common kind of aspect of the system that some people sometimes talk about. So then just picking up on that sort of 3% of people in, in Connor's slide about talking about whether liquidity of access to a pension would, would, would be a determinant of behavior, it's interesting. Certainly anecdotally, you hear that said a lot. It, uh, that's the first time I've seen that stat. I think it's a really interesting one. It's much lower than I would have predicted. But at least behaviorally, there is a kind of counterweight to that, which is to look at to what extent are people in these groups already choosing liquid savings when they're not clearly choosing retirement saving. And, and there is at least I think some evidence that where you see much a huge disparity now because of auto-enrollment between participation rates in pensions among the employed versus the self-employed, there's nothing like the same disparity in other forms of saving. And in fact, roughly similar numbers have some other form of saving among the self-employed as do among the traditionally employed. And they actually have slightly higher, meaningfully higher balances on average. The average ISA value £6,000 versus £5,000. So there's at least demand behavior suggests that liquidity kind of matters to this group, at least at some level. And logically, that makes sense if you assume that, at least for some of them, there's a greater degree of volatility in their income, and therefore, illiquidity is potentially a kind of challenge. So moving on to talk about solutions. So, so, so there's been, a, you know, since the review of automatic enrollment happened at the tail end of last year and shone a bit more of a light on this topic, there's been this kind of groundswell, or a number of people have talked about extending automatic enrollment to the self-employed. And that's definitely a debate that has merit. I just want to kind of put the brakes on it a little bit, at least in as much as kind of saying that it, it is not a panacea solution. It's not going to address the totality of the low levels of saving across these groups for a couple of reasons, in my view. So firstly, kind of true auto-enrollment, as we've used it in the workplace, is, is fundamentally based on inertia and procrastination. Right? It's, 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 it's motivated by the fact that people, generally speaking, will not, not make an active choice in this kind of field of decision-making. And it works because it is something done unto you by someone else. Right? And effectively, the, the, the actor in auto-enrollment is the employer who happens to bear a certain relationship to you, amongst other things, in terms of how you receive your money. <laughs> And crucially, the automatic in automatic enrollment is not just about enrollment. It's about payroll deduction and the kind of automaticity and habitualization and regularization of a deduction from your wages before you experience that money in your take-home pay. And that second bit is really hard to replicate in, an auto, in a, in a self-employment space, even if you could, to some extent, overcome the take-up piece. Now, some of the kind of near auto-enrollment proposals that get talked about are around... Um, the self-assessment system and whether you could do something default-like in the tax system. And I think that is you know, absolutely a kind of worthwhile thing to consider. But again, I just kind of caution that there's a big difference between a behavioral default and a, and a communications default. So yes, you absolutely could, in the, in the self-assessment system, you know, 
pre-check a box for the self-employed that says, we're assuming you want to put a sum of money into a way in a pension, uncheck it if you don't want to. But that, that isn't necessarily going to be as powerful as the money simply being taken before you see it. And we shouldn't assume that it will. And also, I mean, you know, I would worry a little bit about this whole question of salience and the amount of money that's involved. Because certainly, if you're dealing in annual self-assessment for tax purposes, you know, to roll up someone's pension contributions that they might have made over the year and ask them in a somewhat voluntary frame to kind of hand them over in one block is going to shine a light on a much bigger number that's going to be much more salient to the, to the person when they see that as part of a broader set of financial reporting and decisions than, than auto normal in the workplace. So essentially, I think, you know, yes, yes, we should all think about what components of automatic enrollment can be replicated for which parts of the self-employment sector. But we shouldn't, if, if, if possible, we should try and avoid talking in general about the application of auto-enrollment to the self-employed writ large. Firstly, because true automatic enrollment for some of the, at least some of those groups simply isn't a thing. It's just, it's just a couple of words that don't actually describe a, a meaningful process. Um, secondly, because the, the near auto-enrollment alternatives that people have talked about, I just think are unlikely to be as effective as we've seen automatic enrollment be in the workplace. And that kind of leads to, a, to an important third thing for me, which, which I think we, in, we as an industry and, a, and, and the kind of policy community talking about this issue should, should try and kind of remember, which is if, if we're going to set ourselves a kind of expectation benchmark that automatic enrollment or some other intervention in this space is going to move us to looking five years down the line at charts showing 85% of the self-employed saving for a pension, I think it's really unlikely we're going to be able to get there. We don't have the same degree of leverage over behavior in that group as we have through the workplace among the traditionally employed. So at least initially, I think we need to be talking about, well, what are the things that could move the dial for some of these groups, but maybe not assume that we're going to suddenly go from 20% or sub-20% of people saving for their, for their retirement to 70 or 80% in the way that we've seen in the workplace. So given that, kind of what are some of the things that might work? So, so, so I've said that you know, this is an area we're really interested in at Nest Insight, partly because we think it's kind of ripe for behavioral intervention and research. I think there's a whole load of things that could, could be thought about and tried, and I'm kind of looking forward to hearing more about some that I know have been tried elsewhere in the next, in the next talk. But a few things that we kind of think could, could be a part of the solution. So, so the first thing is to think about, well, if you don't have employers acting as aggregators or intermediaries to, to, to the self-employed in the way that they do to workers, what are the other aggregators and intermediaries that may enable you to reach those people behaviorally? And, and some of those, you know, things like unions and member organizations, some are clearly the gig platforms. So you know, the, the relationship that an Uber has to its drivers or that a Lyft has to its drivers at least bear some similarities to a traditional employment relationship. And indeed, we've seen in the states that both Uber and Lyft have tried rolling out sort of pension saving offers to their drivers. So it clearly can be done, and there clearly is a, a willingness to look at doing that. I think it's also worth, I think, as, as Connor mentioned, thinking about kind of large scale contracting organizations, those who use a lot of self employed people on a regular basis and play a role in how those people receive their income. Because even, again, even if, you, you, even if they can't or won't go down the traditional auto-enrollment route, they are at least able to facilitate things like automatic deduction or pre-commitment on behalf of self-employed people. And then the final one that I've mentioned, just because I, I think it's a particularly kind of interesting one, as more people move towards receiving their income for self-employment digitally, are there ways that we can look at how they do that through things like online invoicing software? that would enable the, us to create tools and, and indeed enable those service providers to create tools that, again, allow people in these groups to pre-commit some portion of their future income to saving. So it's almost not mimicking automatic enrollment, but it is mim mimicking automatic payroll deduction and trying to find the equivalence to, to payroll among these groups. So I think the next thing to say is, you know, we really have to try and understand the psychology. I'm not going to talk too much about this because we've got, we've got two, two great um, talks coming up that, that, that touch on this in more detail. I, I, what, what I will say is this. Firstly, you know, we should think about things like the role that messaging related to family might play in motivating people who are self-employed to want to save. And secondly, we should think about the framing of saving. And Shomo is going to talk later about some of the impacts of how you might frame different sums of money over different periods to motivate savings behavior. But, but more broadly, what I think the interesting thing in this space, to me at least, is is the psychology among those who choose to be self-employed different in some way to those who don't? And might that lead to different types of intervention and solution? So is part of the focus on the gig economy, I think, 
tends to lead people down this precarious worker line around how people end up in self-employment. And of course, actually, a lot of self-employed people are there completely volitionally, speak very highly of the experience of being self-employed, cho choose to be there and wouldn't choose to go back. And that at least suggests that there could be some systematic differences in the psychology among people who choose that path compared to choosing a different one. Could be some different attitudes to risk. Could be some different attitudes to, to flexibility. And so I think we should try to understand, are there, are, can we find those systematic differences? And, and, and if we can, do they tell us anything about the kinds of intervention that might help get these groups saving a bit more? So the final thing, and this has been picked up a lot in the last few days because it was mentioned in the Ipsy report that came out earlier in the week, is this whole idea of product design for the self-employed. And a lot of people have talked about the sidecar project that, that we and others are, are working on, or the various sidecar projects that we and others are working on, and applied that question to the self-employed. So we know maybe sidecar is the answer for the self-employed. Um, so, so, so I want to just make a, a, a quick kind of comment on that. Obviously, we're very interested in sidecar and liquidity and the interaction between liquidity and pension saving. To, to my mind, if there is a, an application of a sidecar-like concept for the self-employed, it looks a bit different to the application of sidecar in the workplace. So if you think about you know, the way we've talked about sidecar in the workplace, the thing we're going to be trialing in our own research later in the year is a side-by-side -side model. It's in the title sidecar. So essentially, you ask people to contribute over and above the automatic enrollment minimum at the same time to a more liquid account. And later, as that liquid account accumulates, it becomes a pre-commitment device above a threshold to start rolling more money into the retirement account as well. I kind of wonder, and this is a, a speculation, not a particularly kind of evidence-based comment, I wonder whether there's a model, a similarly hybrid product model in the self-employed space that would actually place these things more sequentially. So essentially, you say to the self-employed, look, start a, start a savings habit, start putting your money away, but none of that money is locked up straight away, and it only starts to become locked up once you've accumulated that barrier. And interestingly, for what it's worth, there are components that look a lot like that in some of the state auto IRA plans that are popping up in the US, where they're actually, at least in some cases, looking at making the first thousand dollars of all pension saving or auto IRA saving accessible through the life of that product and then, and then kind of having more of a lock behind. So I think, yes, you know, do, do things like sidecar potentially play a role in this space? Yeah, I, mean, I absolutely think they're kind of interesting things to pursue. But again, we should step back and try and think about from a problem statement about a specific group of people, what kinds of product design and messaging design are the most likely to work. And, and crucially, we should test those. Um, so, so to finish in terms of my comments, you know, as I said at the start, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about this. You know, what we want to try and do with Nest Insight is try stuff and build an evidence base based on practical solutions that, that work, test out what works, test out what doesn't. Um, and that's very much kind of motivating our thinking about how we might frame some work in this space over the next couple of years. Now, now that said, I do think there is some more traditional evidence to be gathered here. Um, there are segmentation models about the self-employed, and there's data such as kind of presented that, that looks at some aspects of the breakdown of the self-employed. I'd be really interested to see data, and I'm not aware of it, that starts to segment this population more according to the types of solutions that might work. So I don't know what percentage of the self-employed receive their income through a digital channel. I'd love to know that. If, people, if anyone here knows, great. Tell me. If not, I think we should look at whether we need to do a bit more research to try and unpick that kind of thing so that we can think about which potential solutions are going to apply to which parts of this population. I think the second thing that, that, that's a research question, and actually, Abney's colleague, um, Claire, so earlier at the at, um, University of Toronto has been doing some really interesting thinking about this, is this whole question of attitudes to risk and volatility, and do they differ between different people? And if they do, do they imply different types of product preference? So is there any sort of scientific reason to think that the attitudes among some groups among the self-employed are going to lead them to be more open to some types of product design than others. But then crucially, I think the big thing for us is let's try and get out there and test some things. So we've been talking to a number of potential partners um, within those, those aggregator communities, within the research community, to try and think about, well, what are some practical things that we can get out there and try by way of messaging, take up take-up approaches, automaticity of payment approaches. Um, it, we're still, as I say, very early in our thinking about this, but we're excited about, about the possibility that, that research can make a real difference here, and, and very pleased, actually, that the pension minister, Guy Opperman, has been laying down somewhat of a challenge to our industry to try some stuff and see what works. It appears very open to being informed about the future direction of policy in this space by that kind of research. So I'm going to stop there and um, hand over to Abney. All right, so I'm going to tell you a story about Sally. So Sally works hard. 
all right? And she, she really cares about her family. And for Sally, she even has a little picture in her office, you know, with, with her family. Okay, so it's very important to her. And today is a very exciting day. It's payday, all right? And so she's a very responsible woman. And so the first thing that she does is obviously pay her bills, her expenses. She also makes sure to allocate money for groceries and the things that's going to happen until the next pay period. And look at that. She has a little bit of extra money left over. And so she's got a choice to make. So on one hand, she could do maybe the sexier choice in this room, that is contribute to her voluntary savings, right? Then the other option is that, well, she could also take her family out for dinner, a movie, ice cream, right? And so she's making those two choices. Now, let's not worry about Sally, right? And let's think, well, maybe if Professor Richard Thaler, right, if he intervened here and basically was kind of on Sally's shoulder, Right, and trying to, to help her think about the problem in different ways, frame it and, and nudge it in different ways. What would Sally decide? Would she be more likely to make that voluntary contribution or, again, take her family out to dinner? Right? So that's going to happen. Now, let's not talk about Sally. And how about if Sally instead was Susie, as in Susie Orman, a very engaged individual in terms of this financial decision-making aspect? And I'm going to use the word engaged a lot, so. Um, I apologize uh, to the people earlier who said that's a terrible word. So we're going to show you we could use it in different ways. All right, so now how, how about Susie here? How about if instead we, we made that, instead of that decision that felt so far away, that retirement decision, right, we framed it as something that's urgent, something that you urgently have to take care of. Would that change her choices? And then finally, and this is something also mentioned by the earlier session by Jeremy. How about if instead of thinking of Sally's retirement, right, and her voluntary contribution to her own retirement fund, maybe if she cares about her family, we say it's securing her family's future, right? And so I'm going to basically present a number of different experiments, just a portion of the of different experiments that we've run in a field setting in Mexico, at least in this case, to answer some of these questions. Namely, first, does engagement and we're going to tackle engagement in a few different ways in terms of maybe the people who are, are making these choices, differences in the type of people, the message format, right? the, um, and also the medium. Right? Can we have different forms of uh, me mediums of communication that might create a greater sense of engagement? Can that influence voluntary retirement contributions? How about increasing the salience of family? So making that choice not feel so much like an individual decision, but something, again, that will secure your family's future. And really, we're going to be able to take a look at these things and say, well, how do these interventions, the different interventions, compare to past interventions that have worked, things that have been covered in uh, the, the book by Shlomo Bernardzi, Smart, as well as even Nudge and several other kind of past and previous experiments. So we can trade these things off and look at them and see how effective they really are and in what cases can they even potentially backfire. And so basically this is a project or a series of uh, field experiments that were run in Mexico through the partners at uh, Ideas42 and then of course um, myself and my colleagues at University of Toronto. All right. So I'm just going to, we did these experiments in Mexico, and so I'm going to do like about two slides of explaining what the Mexico, Mexican pension system is like. Okay, so first of all, the government has set something up where basically anyone in the formal sector, so I know we're going to talk about self-employment, but at least we'll talk about this, the formal sector in, in, uh, for just a few seconds. But individuals, when you sign up for, when you get this job and you're going through human resources, um, you basically get to pick which retirement company that you are going to make your mandatory 6.5% mandatory contribution to. And, you, and during this period, you get information about these 11 different companies um, as what their return rates were for the last you know, period of time. So then I'm sure several of you are wondering why are there that many companies because you should just choose the best one. Well, two answers to that. One, sometimes there are rotations, particularly in the, the top thir third or so. There's rotations as to which one is the top percentage. And another thing that we're going to deal with that does relate to the self-employed folks, people don't really care 
about these decisions. And so really what ends up happening is that because they don't really care about these decisions, there ends up being a lot of local bias. So what's located, which company is located near you? Despite the fact that you could obviously make these contributions anywhere, online and things like that, but then you're very susceptible to Salesforce, um, bias or you know, basically influence, as well as even things such as, well, my family member works for this one, so I'm gonna just choose this one, all right? And so that's what happens here. And that's great, so if that was enough of the money, then we wouldn't, if, you know, in terms of 6.5%, if that was enough, then we wouldn't have some of the issues that we're seeing in Mexico. Namely, uh, just that 6.5% will only add up to about 40% of their salary. And this is a problem because they have some of the worst rates of elderly poverty, right? the third worst in the world. And then in addition to that, they have the third highest rate of men working uh, past 65 plus and fourth highest rate of women working. So you're basically seeing individuals that are continuing, the idea of the concept of retirement is just not even salient to individuals because they're like, well, we haven't saved, so we have no money, we have to continue working. Right? And that poses a number of different problems. What's interesting here is that there's a need for people to make voluntary retirement contributions and yet less than 0.3 percent of individuals, of the 19 million active pension holders, ever make a voluntary retirement contribution. So we're dealing with, when we were given this data, we're dealing with basically no one does this, okay? So there's no practice of this particular behavior. It's not a positive norm. So it's very difficult then to, to move the needle. So then, so the first thing that we did was we ran a series of qualitative interviews. We, we asked 50 citizens from around Mexico in different age groups, gender, um, you know, formal sector, not formal sector, what are your key barriers? What are the things that you're dealing with? And some of them were certainly echoed in the earlier presentations. Some folks said, well, small contribution amounts, though they don't make actual difference. Right? And so there's an issue there of understanding compounding, compound interest. Okay? Another thing is many folks said that a deposit doesn't actually feel like any money gained because I don't see it for so long. It doesn't feel tangible to me. So it feels actually just like a, a loss. Right? And so then individuals were preferring other mediums of investment such as buying a car or having some, some improvements on a home or having even a machinery, a new machinery part or buying into a bodega because that felt like a material possession that they can see. Right? Some people said, I don't even know how to make a contribution even though they were given forms to, to explain this and they could obviously Google this, they're like, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on, so I don't understand what the, the, the process is even like. But then the one that felt different and was something that um, Jeremy um, also talked about was, I wanna have money easily accessible for my family now. This was this whole issue of the liquidity. So I would not like to contribute in this way because I am really feeling like this is a trade-off between taking my family to dinner versus my own individual kind of retirement contributions. And some of these barriers are reflected in the self-employed folks in the UK as well. But we have to think of it, I think it can apply to many of the issues that are being faced by people who are not contributing to their retirement, is there is that accessibility. I care for my family, I care for the needs, and I feel like this is a trade-off. That's far away, my family, I wanna take care of them here and now. So when we think about choice architecture and nudge, and nudging people to these decisions, one of the things we have to also think about is the social context. Right? We have procrastination, inertia, there's the auto-enrollment, obviously a number of individuals talked about that, but what context are people actually dealing with? And if you think about it, a lot of, and this is even what's been stated earlier today, has been stated in a study financial decision making, many of the nudges and interventions are very individually focused. Put yourself first, your savings, right? Live your dream lifestyle. What's your dream for retirement? Yet, a lot of the world is not working like that. Even interventions that have tried very much to even simulate what the future would look like, they simulate an individualized future. Think of yourself when you're older. But 70% of the world is collectivist. They're not an individual. 
they think of themselves as more part of a group entity. Right? And so in these different cultural cultures, but even within, right, self-employed versus not, there is their variation there in terms of how much people consider them, themselves part of this either autonomous or part of a larger group, a family. And in particular in Mexico, this was a, a, a big issue. Right? If you compare US and the UK, there is the more individualized kind of focus, but Mexico is very low on individualism. And so this became a nice little issue for us to deal with because there hadn't been any work really done on this in terms of looking at the role of family and increasing that salience of family and household for this decision. And, and people do vary in the respect that they care about family. So we have to consider these are the sort of choices that people make. If anyone's seen Breaking Bad, it was a big decision for him is, well, I'm going to sort of trade off legal, I guess, being legal and following the law before my family and taking care of them. So in the first six series of experiments, what we did was we, we didn't have the ability to change the entire Mexico retirement system, unfortunately. But what we did have the ability to do was change these account statements that are delivered three times a year. And so every, every company is, has to send one of these things out at different points in the year. And it's a very exciting form, as you can see. And so we were allowed to basically have a, a randomized control trial where we can manipulate this form in different ways. So we worked with two different firms and at the same period of time, which offered us a really nice look at comparing sort of the Susies and the Susie Ormans of the world versus the Sallies, right? So in this case, they, we worked with one of the companies which was in the bottom half of all the retirement companies. So I would think of them as not really thinking about, not really caring about this decision as much contrasting with sort of the Susie Ormans, which at least they're consciously making a choice to be in that kind of top two or one or two um, companies, right, and choosing into one of those higher performing firms. Okay. And so we had about 130,000 people in total, um, and we ran this study from June through September of 2016. And in this case, what we did is we manipulated the account statement forms using four different forms and comparing that to that old, very boring form that you saw. So let's, let's look at it. And we looked at really the main dependent variable of interest here is just did they contribute any money at all? Right? And we'll get into some of the things in the future in the uh, follow-up studies, but the amount and the number of times. But really, we're looking at that likelihood as being we just want to get people into that positive habit. OK, so this was basically this redesigned form. It's much better, right? I think so. And so it, little things such as um, uh, you see that little thermometer, so indicating where you are. And we didn't want to also scare everybody by putting them in the red, which is the case for many individuals. So instead, we, we put that pretty much for everyone at this, this current standard. And, and you'll see. Um, the other part of the form will say, what is, if you just stop now and you don't do anything, then what is that salary? And it's on average 40% of this, you know, what's your salary when you retire? And it's on average about 40% of their current salary. And so what we did was we manipulated certain things. So individuals say, okay, some, some studies have said gains are really helpful in certain, to create positive habits. So how much would you gain if you had contributed to your retirement over and above um, the traditional savings account right? versus some other research has shown losses are effective. So then we have a loss aversion frame where you say, how much money did you lose by not contributing to your retirement account and instead opting for a traditional savings account? We also, individuals said they don't know what the process is like, so we also had a little wallet cutout card that gave them the information of their corp, which is like um, kind of a social insurance type number. So that's the number that they need in order to make a contribution, as well as the amount that they want to contribute. And that sort of serves as a little reminder. And on the back side of it is exactly the process of how to make that contribution at the, all the different channels that they could do this. And so we thought that would be helpful. And then finally, uh, there is a, kind of a very subtle family manipulation. So what would you like to be doing in the future, do you want to secure your family's future? Um, right? So there's like this nice little person who is able to hang out with his family versus this other person who is not and is working late. Right? 
Okay, so let's talk about the folks who are in the top, some of the top two firms. Okay, so these are the, we would call them the Susie's, the Susie's of the group, which is the highly engaged individuals in that they care about their, um, they've at least cared enough to be in a top performing firm. So here is the, the control, right? And you see, again, it's the, in the high performing firm, you still get about 0.9%, right? This is, it's, it's, it's quite low. But with all the different treatments, right, the, the ones that have been previously shown to work, gain frame, loss frame, wallet cutout, right, we see a significant boost that any of these interventions seem to work, um, is significantly better than the control group. In addition, as is the family. So it's working as well as these previous interventions that have been shown historically to work and kind of are the key, the, the key benchmarks of nudges that have worked in the past. Right. And we saw basically, even though you see this marginal change, you'd say, oh, it's not that much, really. It's actually greater, it's about a relative change of 50%. And you're changing these folks who, again, are, it's, it's not a positive norm, so you're really working against the system. Right? And still greater than 50% relative change. Now let's talk about the Susies of the group, people who are not engaged, and they've now, they're in the bottom half, right? They're in the, uh, this was done with one of the bottom half um, companies. And here, so this is much lower, it's about 0.4, 0.45, and now none of the interventions work, right? None of them work. The family is not any worse than anything else, but none of these interventions work, right? And so we asked ourselves, we said, well, what's going on here? Well, we know that these highly, well, I, you know, I lose the term, I use the term highly, but in these engaged consumers are responding to pretty much any of these uh, nudges that will help with the decision-making process, but the other folks are not responding to anything. Right? In some cases, with certain groups of people, some of these interventions actually backfired, creating it to be uh, worse than before. But then you say, well, what, what's really going on here? Um, and of course, uh, one thing I should mention is that at any point you can switch firms, and 90, I think 91% of people never switch, and of those who switch, 80% of them switch to a worse performing firm, right? So that's a research project in and of itself, but that's, we see no switching, which I guess in this case is a good thing um, as well. So you could have also said, well, maybe the folks in the low engagement, come, or the, the lower performing firm switched over to high performing, wasn't the case. There was no significant differences there. So we said, well, what's going on here? Well, maybe folks were like me, where I don't read my mail. And in fact, that's a lot of uh, individuals will, particularly younger individuals are like, who reads mail anymore? Right? So that could be an issue. Um, so then one thing we said, well, can we increase the, the urgency of opening the mail? And so we ran another field experiment where, and I, I have used this with some of my colleagues, and so I thought, let's just try this. Where we mailed these forms at the end of May, he said, open this by the 20th of June. What happens then? Nothing. I have no idea. But just open it at that point, right? And, and just getting individuals to respond to that. Um, it is something that, you know, the people respond to these deadlines. And what we found there is that in that first month, right, so they, it was mailed out about May, May 20th or so, and then within that first month, you did see an increase in the contribution rates. Right? So just even having that thing on the actual form itself, just that date seemed uh, on the, not the form, sorry, it was on the envelope that was mailed. So it was right on the front of the envelope, open this by the 20th of June. And that did seem to bump up the rates uh, by 54%, right? Relative, um, relative change of 54%. But uh, at, at months two and three, did not, so basically it's a kind of, um, the effect doesn't persist, right? which makes sense. After you've opened it on June 21st, or you might as well just not open it afterwards, and you're probably, again, sitting on that pile. So I said, well, okay, what are other ways you can increase urgency? How can you get people to feel more engaged if they're not opening their mail at all, right? And so, and then also, do we need more of an explicit mention of family, because that, in that form, if, they it would just it sort of hinted at that, but do we need some sort of explicit mention? How long does this effect really persist? Where if you mention family, for example, or any of these interventions, how long does that actually change behavior? Does it create better habits? And there are there contexts where maybe a family appeal could backfire, right? Or any of these nudges could backfire. 
And so in this case, at this point in time, the retirement company uh, that we were working with, which was actually the one the, that was performing the bottom half, right? so it was one of the low engagement consumers, they said that they had an opportunity, or they were basically testing on a service where they could give messages via SMS. And so they can go directly to people's phones. They hadn't used this yet, and they, they were questioning whether they should, but it could encourage people to then make a contribution via an, you know, uh, an SMS or, or even via their mobile thing. It would connect them to the website right, with smartphones, right, and the website, and they can make a contribution that way. And what's neat about that is that so at this point, um, most of the interventions that have been done using SMS have been, in, in the financial context, have really been these just-in-time decisions. So things such as, hey, you have a low balance. Right? The FCA here has done these low balance alerts. You have basically, please transfer this money or else you have overdraft fees. In addition, okay, a bill is due today, so and we're taking that money out, so just warning you again of that. And so these just-in-time decisions are via SMS are considered to be pretty urgent. And there has been research to show that just basic reminders and basic alerts, they, wor they work to increase contribution rates, in part because SMS is perceived to be a much more urgent form. I'm not going to open the mail. It doesn't feel that urgent. But my, my texts, I, I do believe that that's much more urgent and closer in time and something that is more important. So we thought, why not use this as something that we could then test out an, another set of nudges or frames, message formats, to get people to increase their voluntary retirement contributions. So in this case, we partnered again with that low-performing firm. And what we were interested in, and, and we ran this from October through December, and we were interested in, well, let's compare just that new statement alone to make sure these are all new people from the first study. So it wasn't, there wasn't a cross over there. But this is just a new statement to make sure that at least we have similar data where some of these new statements are not, this revitalized statement is not working effectively. And let's compare that to a series of SMS treatments that we, we tested out, a number of different SMS frames. And so what we did here is we compared the control to the new statement. And while you saw a significant increase, well, sorry, while you saw a, an increase in terms of the means, it wasn't significant, right? Um, but just having that new statement plus the SMS text, you did see a boost, right? So just to even any, if we just lump all the different SMS treatments, providing that SMS to begin with led people to be more likely to make a voluntary retirement contribution. Okay. Now let's break it down into the different treatments that we used. Because right? we, we, you know, I'm, spoiler alert, I did say that family is going to become important here, all right? And so we had a basic alert, since there is a published paper to show that basic alerts work. We had a pennies a day, so just for the price of a cup of coffee, right? This has been so shown to work, pennies a day, then you can improve your retirement contributions. We also used the fresh start. So don't worry about your past. Today is a new day, right? Then make a retirement contribution. Uh, then we had an individual goals, and I'll show you that in just a second, and then a family, securing your families. So secure your, your individual future, and then the more explicit version of family, secure your family's future. Okay? And so these were the texts, and really all that's important here, so these are the messages. Everybody, except, so everybody was sent a introductory text to say you can make these on, so we didn't want uh, any bias where the folks in the control condition, for example, never got any information that they can make these online payments via their phone. So everyone got a basic message to say that, an introductory message to say we are offering this service. But then in the different, in the different other conditions, the basic alert, small amounts, so that's the pennies a day, the fresh start, then they also received information to say with the particular prompt. Again, this is a fresh start, um, so on and so forth. But what we're looking at here is this contrast between the individual security and the family security. So in one case, we said secure your own financial future versus secure your family's future, so you and your family, OK? And that's what we're really going to be testing, uh, testing out here. And again, we tested the contribution likelihood, the amount, and the number of times that people contributed. So with the control group, this is their percent making a contribution, about 0.5%. With the new statement, it's 0.55, not significant, OK? 
with the basic, the fresh start, small amounts, things that have already been proven to work, right? didn't work here, and th this with, with our folks in Mexico and with these low, in low engaged f folks. Individual security also did not work. But then what was significantly impactful, just saying securing your family's future, that family security, now not only do you have that engaging medium, but you've really addressed some of the concerns that people have. It's now you're trading off, instead of just thinking of the retirement as an individual item, it's about securing your family's future, really appealing to what people care about. So then a question that, and that was about a 45% increase relative to the control group. And so these are, these are pretty powerful in terms of uh, really changing that. So even though we're dealing with low percentages overall, I mean, this is not a positive norm, and yet these things are boosting uh, contribution rates. All right, so what we're gonna look at is now the amount contributed, so not only just making a contribution, but the amount the average contribution rate and then the number of times people contribute. And what I wanna point out here, if you can see either side, is that really we're not affecting the amount that they contribute, the number of times, the average contribution rate. What we're changing here is the likelihood that they make a contribution to begin with, okay? And so that's really the important element. You're not seeing a backfire either. It's really you're changing people from going to nothing to making that contribution and they start looking like everybody else who has made a prior contribution, okay? And so one thing we were able to also do is that we were able to look at what happened. So we ran this from October through December, but then we were able to look at the next period. So from March through, uh, sorry, from uh, January 1st to the, Mar the end of March. And what we found there is the people who made a contribution in that first period are now more likely to make it in the second period. Do we think that they remember the text? Absolutely not. But what it did do is create a positive habit. 80% of people who've made a prior contribution are more likely to make a contribution in the next period. So putting these folks on a positive track. And the final thing that I'm gonna articulate is that it should be motivated by family, right? And so for individuals that care maybe about family, it should work more, better for them. But how about individuals who don't care about family, maybe if younger folks, or maybe older folks because they've already moved on in life. And so what we used here was machine learning to look at age effects. Right? And what the, what the, this is the wagner athey model and the causal tree model and basically separated it out into two, eight, three age buckets. And so first is the folks who were 27 and under, which makes sense. The marriage age in Mexico is 26 and a half. So then right after that, right, one more year later, so about 28 or so, it's probably when people may, might have a family. Right, and start having kids. And then the work age, the next age bucket, was 42 that it separated on. And what happens there is that individuals are, uh, like young kids are starting to work at the age of 15 or so. So then that makes sense. So maybe at that point, folks are thinking, well, now they're kind of responsible of trying to take care of the next, next thing. And so what we did is we separated them out into these buckets, and I'll show you the visualization there, is that for folks who are younger, Saying securing your family's future actually backfired relative to the control. Right? Could be that you say now, oh, I, now I have to wait only until I have a family. Right? So it backfires. The folks that are in that family window, if you will, now is a boost. And it's relatively about the same kind of boost. It's about a 68, almost 70% change, but negative in one case, positive in the other. And then it really didn't affect anything uh, for the people who are older, so maybe it washed away. And just to show you that we don't have age effects in the other conditions, really, it's really that family security that's working, but in one case is positive, in the other case it's negative. And so, the, the, basically the final thing that I guess I'm gonna say, these conclusions, with it, I know this word is bad, right? This engaging word, right? The, the, the word of engagement, but we could think of engagement in many different ways. First of all, in terms of making the form more visually appealing. These are these small changes that can have profound effects if people have positive habits, such as in the UK or in the US, where more people do this. Right? There is a positive norm. How about the medium? Right? Could be SMS. It's much, uh, we have finan the new financial innovation. Technology can help us here to at least encourage positive behavior. The timing, even encouraging people to think about urgency, deadlines. And finally, motivation. 
people who have already done this right, behavior in the past? How do we appeal to them or the motivation of family? That becomes important. And I think this is one of the first studies that ever documented the importance of that social element and that collective element at creating positive long-term contribution behaviors. We have to think about this as we're moving forward. And finally, for policymakers, all of you guys, this is the most exciting group to talk to. You guys can make a difference. Context is key. We used qualitative research to be able to point out the fact that family is important. Right? And we looked at that, and that was kind of the prompt of, of this new intervention. And yet, right, instead of sometimes thinking about we couldn't change the Mexican government's retirement system, maybe just thinking about these small changes of the, how we deliver the messages, they can be quite impactful in these relative changes. And financial innovation makes it easier for us to strategically segment. So we're not saying family for the younger folks, perhaps, where you would have a backfire. Um, and what was nice is that this is a win-win solution. For the firm, it's great, because obviously then they make money. For the consumers, it's great, because they're creating positive norms. And so, and, and as I mentioned, 80% of people who made a prior contribution more likely to make a next one. And this is something that can be quite impactful. And they've scaled up this intervention from you know, a few hundred thousand people now to 21 million. And so we're now going to see if hopefully it continues to work. All right, with that, thank you very much.